Today is the first Sunday of Advent, the first day of the new liturgical year, but um, surely you know that Advent calendars, by and large, don't actually work on the Advent dates. They work on December, right? Uh, they count from 1 to 24, and so it was that two days ago on Friday, my kids bounded down the stairs at whatever ungodly hour, 6.15 or something it was, <laughs> anxious to open day one of their Trader Joe's chocolate advent calendars. <laughs> Inside each little window of these is a chocolate. You know, this is the month when they get breakfast appetizers of chocolate the whole month. Day after day, 24 increasingly stale chocolates. And each of these advent calendars, each of their three advent calendars, has a different advent scene um, printed on the front of it. There is one where Santa is baking cookies. Uh, there's one where there's a nutcracker band and like three band members holding their instruments and all the nutcrackers have that half smiling, half terrified, half constipated face they all have, you know? <laughs> there's a red pickup truck on one of them um, driving through the snow with a Christmas tree in the back of it. Uh, you know, different secular and, and saccharine depictions of the holiday ideal we long for this season. I think there are five Trader Joe's Advent calendar scenes in all. Um, and none of them are Advent, actually. They're all Christmas. Like, they're no good Advent scenes. Like, I want one that's like a Hieronymus Bosch end of the world sort of thing. You know, it's like <laughs> the stars falling from heaven and the skies ripped open and the mountains split by earthquakes and conflagrations of fire and people running terrified from the bright light of righteousness. And, a real Adventy sort of Advent calendar, you know? Like, there are none of those, as far as I can tell. As I know, that's not really what you're waiting for. Like, we're waiting for Christmas, for the family to come, for the figgy puggy pudding and the stockings and the presents and the lights and to sing Silent Night with candles. That's what we're waiting for. And then you come in here today, and you get... <coughs> Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake in your presence. That's Isaiah. And then we get to the gospel, and Jesus is like, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars are falling from heaven. Like, what are we doing in here? Do the people who put these scriptures, do they not understand what time of year it is? Like, we are decking the halls with balls of holly, right? It looks beautiful in here. And then we are undecking the heavens from stars. What Isaiah and Jesus are speaking about is a theophany. Theophany. You guys can say it? Theophany? Theophany. Good. It's like your first Sunday of Advent vocabulary word. And it's a dramatic revelation of God's presence, God's appearance in the world. When we speak about Jesus coming back, the second coming, like, that's that sort of theophany. When every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. It's the kind of thing when God shows up, not in like a little way, but like in a big way, all the ways that leaves no room for doubt, or frankly, no room for faith either. Um, it, look at what Isaiah asked for, though. It's a, it's a plea to God. He says, oh, that you would come down and tear open, or you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence. And we know more about mountains and the way they work than Isaiah did, but like mountains symbolically are like the foundations of the world, the columns, the pillars. Like if they shake, if they move, everything is subject to this power. And then Isaiah goes on, as when fire kindles brushwood and fire causes water to boil. And fire is always a sign of the divine presence. Moses speaks to God in a burning bush. Fire engulfs the prophets of the idol Baal on the mountaintop. Our God is a consuming fire, <coughs> Scripture says. Even today, we mark the presence of God in the sacrament with a flame. Isaiah does not want like a little appearance of God. He doesn't want a hint of God, a sprinkling of God. He wants the whole thing, like maximum pyrotechnics. And this happened once before in Israel's history. It happened in the Exodus story with the plagues and the pillar of fire and the cloud and Mount Sinai, when God came down on the mountaintop and there was darkness and fire and earthquakes and thunder and lightning, 
And all that had to do with the story of God coming and freeing his people from slavery to the Egyptians. And it was this sort of theophany that Isaiah wanted again. <coughs> Deliverance with like the raw power of God. Now, Isaiah wants this deliverance. I, I won't bore you with the like historical minutia of his situation, but, but I, foreign enemies are too powerful. The people of God are, are shrinking in number and influence. The economy is not working for everyone. The wicked seem to be succeeding and prospering. People are vicious and they are uncaring and they are selfish and divided. And there's a combination of environmental catastrophe and artificial intelligence that threatens to destroy the whole world. And, Sorry, that last bit, that's actually not Isaiah's problem. That one's ours. <laughs> but like the rest of it, we share with them. You know, and it, it seemed like the best. The only full solution to the problem was for God to just step in decisively. No more half measures. You know, now is the time for God to rip off his warm-ups, let out a primal scream, and whoop somebody. Now, if you haven't, at some point in your life, wanted God to come down and whoop somebody, what is wrong with you? <laughs> like, haven't you ever been at a stoplight on a random Tuesday and thought, what if Jesus comes back right now? What if we could suddenly say, see to everyone who doubted that we've been right all along about this faith thing. We've been on God's side. If God would just come down and show them unequivocally, beyond any shadow of a doubt, would that God would just come down and fix this mess. Come, Lord Jesus. Everyone, I think, at one time or another, longs for this thing to happen. Isaiah did. I have. That you have. All of us. And Advent is actually the season when we remember that, like, the bills are too big. The health problems are too dire. The political situation is too bad. The family heartache is too deep. The future is too in doubt for us to feel confident in any other solution than God just taking over. So if you are not driving a red pickup truck through the snow with a freshly cut pickup tree or a Christmas tree in the back this season, but instead are lying awake worrying about your child and the interest rates and the next PET scan, like, welcome. This is your time of year. Come, Lord Jesus, just like Isaiah asks. Now, Isaiah, after he pleads for this epic theophany, he acknowledges that there is um, another problem. The people, we're reading it today, like we, the people, we have sinned, we have transgressed, we have all become like one who is unclean. We have, as the end of verse 7 says, we have been delivered into the hand of our iniquity. So remember how those first verses about the earthquakes and the fire, they recalled God's epic deliverance of the people from Egypt? Well, the people are not in Egypt anymore. They're in sin. We need deliverance, but not from Pharaoh. We need deliverance from sin. We need a theophany that delivers us from sin. Now, in point of fact, what we're going to get in 21 days, I fixed the math since the children's sermon. What we're going to get in 21 days is a theophany. That's what Christmas is. Right? God literally comes down, like the end of verse 1 asks for. Love came down at Christmas, you say. God is revealed directly in the flesh of Jesus Christ. And yet, in the Christmas theophany, all the other physical manifestations of the theophany are missing. There are no earthquakes. There's no fire, there are no trembling mountains or nations afraid. Like, we get the theophany, God comes, but it does not look at all like the thing Isaiah wanted. Or, if we're honest, it doesn't look like the thing we want. 
Like what we want is the kick butt God. And what we get is the God who has to have his butt wiped. Like why is that? Well, there's a hint, I think, in verse 8. In your Isaiah reading. Verse 8 says this, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. It's a beautiful line. But also, it means we're clay vessels. And you know what's really hard on clay vessels? Earthquakes. God's goal is to save us, not to shatter us. And so we get the theophany, but it's shaped like a baby boy and not like the end of the world. God comes down just like Isaiah asks, just like we want, but as Jesus, the son of Mary, not as fire and smoke and the son of man riding on the clouds. It's totally natural for us to want God to come down and just whip things into shape. But deliverance from sin isn't actually a whoop somebody problem. Because we're among the somebodies who would get whooped. Sin is still attached to us. It's still braided into the loves we have, into the way we think and judge ourselves and others, about the, it's braided into the angers and the fears that motivate us. Sin, sin is using us as a human shield. There's a scene in what I think is the best Christmas movie, Home Alone. I know you wanted me to say Die Hard, but like that's not real. <laughs> There's a scene in the best Christmas movie, Home Alone, that illustrates the problem God is trying to deal with. So here, you guys can watch. What are you doing, Marv? Mom? All right, I'm pause it there for a second. <laughs> that tarantula is sin. Okay? It would be good to get rid of sin. And our boy Marv here, he's going to get rid of sin in the dramatic whoop somebody way. Okay? <laughs> Can finish the scene. <laughs> scene. Marv, what are you doing? Come on. <laughs> this is funny. Unless you're Harry, he's the guy that gets here at that scene. The problem is that the sin is still attached to Harry. Right? It is not good for Harry to have the tarantula destroyed or attempted to be destroyed as long as the tarantula is still on Harry. God is not Marv. It's not that God couldn't kill sin that way, but that God wouldn't do that to us. God is not Mark. God knows it is not good for us to have sin destroyed like that as long as it still clings to us. What we need is to have Christ Jesus get the sins off our chest and onto his shoulders. We need to be delivered from our sin before the sin is destroyed. We do need God to come down. We do need a theophany, but we need the kind that comes at Christmas. There will be a second coming when God makes all things right. That too is a part of our faith. But while we wait for God to make all things right during Advent, what we actually get at Christmas is God coming down to make us right. It's not good for the mountains to shake as long as our spiritual house is still built on sand. It is not good for us as clay vessels to be in an earthquake. So God first makes space for us in his unshakable heavenly home. And what this gives us in our life is the chance, as the parable says, to keep awake and do the work God has given us to do, to live into our future with hope and forgiveness and freedom. 
We long for God to make everything right. That's what we wait for in Advent. That's what we want. There's nothing wrong with wanting that. But what we're actually going to get at Christmas is God coming to make us right, which is what we need first. Like the order of operations here matters. And so we wait, confident that however hard the waiting is, God is not marred. He loves us enough to save us first. Amen. Amen.